Welcome to the 28th annual New York African Film Festival. The, um, the, the piece that I believe you just watched, which is why you're tuning into the Q&A now, is Maasai Remix. And we're lucky enough to have the filmmakers here to speak with that, that film this evening. So first, can I please welcome um, Ron Mulvey-Hill and mm -hmm. Kelly Askew. Um, do you want, can we just start off with, could you both just tell us a little something about yourself before we get right into the films? Sure. Go ahead. Okay, so I'm an anthropologist. I teach at the University of Michigan and I have worked in East Africa for 33, going on 34 years now, um, mostly in K Tanzania, but also in Kenya. And Ron and I know each other because we had the same Swahili teacher years and years ago. Who connected us at UCLA. And you're the producer on this film. Yes, and co-director. Co okay, and Ron? Yes, uh, well I was uh, uh, blessed to be an exchange student at the University of Nairobi in 1978 and that was uh, years ago and I was able to be a student of Ngugi uh, uh African Literature Department at the University of Nairobi and that was sort of uh, and at that, during that year, I made my first film, Sharing is Unity, uh, with my uh, best friend at the university with his family uh, in a little uh, area called Malaba on the border of Kenya and Uganda. And ever since then, I've been working on uh, making films about Africa, uh, focusing on the good news of Africa. Well, no, that's certainly what you did here. Can you tell me the, um, this, this specific topic, how did you come upon this story? So um, I'm part of an interdisciplinary team. We've been doing research on land rights and land conflicts um, for about 12 years now. It's a team involving researchers from Tanzania and Denmark and the US. And we've been training a bunch of Tanzania, Tanzanian social scientists, uh, which has been very, very rewarding. But in the course of our research, we came to um, discover this pattern that when we found cases, and there are many cases of, of people being evicted from their land as more and more land gets given over to the purpose of conservation and tourism and agricultural, um, ag agriculture, industrialized agriculture, but also extractive industries. Um, so as more and more land is being diverted to these other um, largely corporate driven um, purposes, land gets uh, taken away from people who are very dependent on the land for their livelihoods. That includes small scale farmers, but it also includes pastoralists and hunter gatherers because there's a diversity of ethnic groups, some 122 or more ethnic groups and language groups in Tanzania and very different lifestyles. Um, so we came to discover that pastoralists and hunter-gatherers are really on the front lines when their land gets taken for conservation purposes. And the irony of it is that it's taken for conservation because they're such good stewards of the land. Pastoralists, hunter-gatherers um, count as indigenous people in the context of Africa, and they tend to leave little mark on the landscape of the way in which they survive. So rotational grazing for pastoralists, some days the livestock are here, the next day they're somewhere else. And it looks like for the times that they're not there that the land is available and free. So other people think, well, they're not using it. So we have a better purpose. Um, but increasingly it's, it's, Tanzania is one of the top safari destinations. And, and so in order to attract yet more tourists, yet more land keeps being sequestered for the purposes of fortress conservation, which means that human activities are prohibited or greatly restricted. So did you so, take the story to Ron? So yeah, so Ron and I know each other for many years and um, this community of Maasai pastoralists that I came to know and, and developed close ties to asked, asked me if I would assist them to make a film about their community. And since I worked as, as you heard, as an associate producer on Ron's feature length um, uh, film Mangamizi, which was um, a candidate for the Academy Awards. Um, I asked him to help me out and, and, and make this film. Okay. So uh, what, are either one of you living in Tanzania by any chance? 
I've lived in Tanzania for three years and go back and forth almost every year, at okay. least two or three times. Okay, so you were going, you were traveling there to actually shoot the film. I was traveling there to work in the community, and they asked me to come and yeah, shoot shoot the film based on a ceremony that one of the members of the film was undergoing. But then it grew and grew and grew into something that ended up being two films. Ron can talk more about that. Okay. Yeah. So we we met on actually uh, Kelly's uh, second film. Uh, that she uh, shot in the same area uh, with some of the same uh, uh, players in it. And uh, we, we wanted to shoot uh, an ethnographic style uh, film on preserving the last uh, rite of passage for men um, called the Lorbach ceremony. And um, when we were shooting that ceremony, it entails a big uh, party and, uh, and celebration and a lot of relatives and people come from all over and everyone was there talking about all the social issues and challenges the community is facing. And Kelly uh, uh, encouraged us to interview uh, people about with these conversations uh, from land, uh, women's education, uh, environment, uh, uh, new, new things going on in the community. And so we, we, we originally thought we would include all of this into one film, but when we started editing, uh, we realized the ceremony was sort of becoming lost in all the social issues. So we decided on two films. So the prequel to this film is called uh, Rite of Elders. Orkitang uh, Lorbach, and um, you can access that through our website, uh, grigryfilms.net. Okay. So um, I asked if you were living there only because it seemed like it was filmed over quite a large period of time. So I was just wondering how much of the back and forth. So how, how long did you follow these three, these three subjects and how did you choose them? So the, the village of Lesoit, which is where much of the action takes place um, at the time was under the leadership of Frank Ole Kaipai, who's one of the three main characters in Maasai Remix. He is the main character of the other film that Ron just mentioned, Orkitang Lorbach, Rite of Elders. And it was he who asked me to come and film his final rite of passage ceremony. But in, in the process of our conversation, and because I had filmed um, a previous film in that same community. And one of the big frustrations to me was, I'm fluent in Swahili, but I am not fluent in Ma, which is the language of the Maasai community. And I found that many men speak Swahili because they've had access to education, they've had access to trade networks and to urban migration, but very few women speak Swahili in the community. So I said, if we're gonna make this film, I'd like this time to be able to access women's perspectives. It's very important to me. Um, so can we please try to find somebody in the community, a relative or, or a, a girl that's graduated from high school who can do the translation between Swahili and Ma. And so he asked around and one thing that comes out in this film, hopefully that you've noticed is that their, their families are very, very large. So um, he discovered that he had a cousin that he didn't realize because there's so many cousins who is a young woman who was a teacher, employed as a teacher in, in, one, of the t in one of the larger cities in Tanzania named Arusha. So um, he asked her to come to his ceremony so that she could serve as a translator and interpreter. Um, but as we came to know her, we came to discover that she was being responded to very differently in the community than other, than other people whom you know, people haven't seen in a while. It wasn't the normal, oh, it's so lovely to see you again. It was. It was a different reaction and in inquiring like, why are, why are people so surprised or why are they treating her with such um, amazement? It came to, came to light that her story was a quite unusual one where it was known throughout her, this village and many surrounding villages that her father had accommodated her wish to go to secondary school and continue with her education beyond secondary school and not forced her to marry the man that he had agreed to give her to in marriage. And 
And this was a major issue because it meant that the man had to give back, he had to be given back the 12 cows that he had provided Evelyn's father. Oh, and, this you met Evelyn. Yes, I'm talking oh. about Evelyn, sorry. <laughs> Evelyn okay. came and was supposed to be the interpreter for a film about Frank's ceremony. But as, as things developed and as we could see what was happening and how people were responding to her, um, we realized something, something was unusual about her story. And little by yeah. little came, came to discover that she had a very unusual story and that she fought for the right to her education. And she had a father willing to support her in that, even to the point of being mocked and ridiculed by the community for returning the cows that had been contracted as part of this marriage agreement. And uh, also Evelyn's mentor uh, was Adam, who's also in the film. And uh, so Adam's story was very interesting too. And uh, uh, fortunately we were able to uh, be able to film and include all three of these uh, wonderful leaders uh, in one film. And that was uh, a challenge in itself because uh, a film could be made on each of them. Yet um, with the, the remixing of the culture and, and the title of the film, uh, it, it just made so much sense once we had it all together that uh, the three character, the three uh, leaders that we feature in the film uh, come, come across the way they do. Did you get to, I'm sorry, but say something? No, just that we filmed it over the course of four years to answer your other oh, okay. question. So first met Evelyn in 2013 and um, followed her, her, her pursuit of the education into the American context, was able to follow Adam into the UN um, on more than one occasion actually, and, and then tie all these strands together into this film that you see about three individuals and the three different ways that they're trying to um, mash up, I guess, their love of their tradition and heritage with new resources, be it international um, community, international advocacy uh, forums, or higher education, or even secondary school education in the context of a village in Tanzania where it's still viewed with some suspicion. Well, it was really interesting. And I, I mean, I was surprised to see how people could go to the village for support that when there were issues with their family. So like, so when they, when they stole his um, father's cow and so that, I was so shocked and horrified, but um, I was very surprised to see, I'm like, wow. So he can totally work around his dad by going to like the elders to get them to intercede for him. And then did the, did the village then repay his father for the cow? I don't think the village did he oh, okay. to be reconciled. I mean, by the time that he ended up back in the village facing his father, two years had passed because that one cow supplied him enough money to keep himself going in high school for two full years. And it was actually, we couldn't tell the whole story, but the, the backstory is that his parents had no idea. This is pre days of, you know, there were no phones. There, there was very few means of communication and his parents had consulted a diviner to see is our son still still alive and the diviner said oh yes he's alive he went eastwards send someone out to find him and a brother of adams was sent to go to towns and and search for him and found him in the city that i actually lived in for two full years tanga tanzania which is which has multiple secondary schools and is known as a place where many people went to school in fact the very first german colonial school was built in tanga and that is where adam had ended up and he ran into his brother. He, was, he said he was wait, sitting on somebody's porch and he saw a figure in the distance. He was like, oh, man, that looks very familiar to me. And that turned out it was his brother. Come to find him and say, you must come home. Our parents don't know if you're alive or dead. And then he came home and unlike the prodigal son situation where the father came running out to meet him, his father said, you stole a cow from me. <laughs> and the elders had to be called in to solve that problem <laughs> oh wow okay yeah that is a kind of story that's amazing yeah. um well one of the things i was going to ask you but you've already answered what um you saying so frank is the one who invited you to to make the film so i was just because i was wondering how the community felt 
when you were filming, people seemed pretty at ease with you being present. So could you talk a little bit about how the film was received while you were making it? Sure, so this is the third film I've made in that community. The first one was called The Chairman and the Lions. It's available through Documentary Educational Resources and that was with a different director named Peter Biella. Um, but even at that point, I had already been working in the village for over a year and a half um, and, and knew the community I had stayed. I'm an anthropologist, I'd like to stay in the community, um, get to know people. And in that case, I was asked to make a film because there, there was a problem where lions had started attacking their cattle. And if there's one thing that Maasai are famous for, it's being able to protect their cattle from attackers, including lions and leopards. And they just were having trouble um, dealing with this problem. And so I, I was called in to make a film about how the older lion killers were now training the warriors once again in new techniques and the techniques that they knew. So after making that film and people being familiar with filmmaking and seeing us, you know, with the mics and the booms and things like that, it was it was kind of, oh yeah, we've seen this before. Kelly's been here and doing that. And and Ron was a wonderful collaborator because he stayed in the film, in the village. We stayed in the village um, for the time that we were we were doing the filming and we really participating in, in the community's events. And I think uh you know, the history of my films, I've always felt um, uh, that they're really co-productions with the people we're featuring in the films. And if you don't have that uh, invitation, uh, then you get a whole different film. And uh, I think that kind of trust uh, shows through and, uh, uh, you know, many films are made without that trust. And uh, that's what uh, I love uh, working with Kelly, although I i haven't done all the research, but uh, she's she's worked years and, and built relationships. And um, I was trusted because, uh, not that I spent as much time in the village, but because uh, there was a relationship uh, built up between uh, Kelly and and the village and the people in the village and also um, the films that we make uh, it without the collaboration and the people themselves um, the leaders in the film really are are as well producers on the film and have a lot of uh, uh, input on how the film uh, comes about so uh, I think uh, hopefully the viewers can can feel that as well. No, you definitely can feel, there's like, there's an intimacy because that's just wondering how long you've been there because when, like, when, when Evelyn has that conversation with her mother about the younger sister, I was like, yikes, this is really difficult. Yeah. And I also was wondering when they were filming, because you, you don't speak Ma, right? You say. No, and, and that day, you know, well, I, I've made, quite a number of films and over the years, you know, uh, you, you, you can sort of have a feeling when something's going on. I knew this was an important conversation, but I didn't know it's about it, but I was so glad that I followed her. We were eating a meal and her mother wanted to catch up on the house she was building uh, for her mother. And, and then this conversation opened up, which I, we had not planned. I don't think you told them <laughs> to have this conversation, Kelly. Uh, but uh, I knew I shouldn't turn the camera off and I kept going. <laughs> and it's, it's the highlight for me in, in the film. And, um, you know, many ethnographic or uh, anthropological films in the past tended to be process sort of oriented. You, you never really got the interaction. And filmmaking for me is all about interaction. And even though we're seeing uh, different uh, scenes, uh, the interaction has always, as a filmmaker, been the most important thing for me. That was a, that was a really beautiful scene. And I was, I was so struck, you know, so I feel like the story of the, the person going off to get education and coming back is told in so many different ways. And, to have the mother 
so hold her ground with her. It's like you just because you've gone there and have achieved this status or gotten this education, you don't get to tell me, you know, so she's like, no, this is what, I mean, she's open to it, but she, I really appreciate that she held her ground. It was a really intimate scene and I was like, wow, they're just having this in front of the camera. This is amazing. And, yeah. and Kelly worked uh, uh, a lot with Evelyn to make sure we had, you know, the conversation is a very intricate conversation and to get the translation and, and also to place the subtitles in such a way where it wasn't confusing for the audience. Um, we, we spent a lot of time on that. Yeah. And thanks to Evelyn, we were able to, you know, really bring it across. Yeah, we, we must have shot, Ron, I don't know if you can even guess, over 40 hours of film. Um, and we translated and transcribed all of it. We, we, I, I remember having a curious conversation with another filmmaker and, and was speaking about all this prep time that goes into the translating, the translating, the translating to see what we have. And, and this other filmmaker had said, oh, but I only edit by the visuals. You know, if it's not a nicely shot scene, it's out. But there's so much in the text and the conversations that even if maybe maybe the lighting wasn't perfect, but um, but the but the the message and the, and the conversations and the themes that we're building over the course of the film are are embedded in a certain conversation. We're going to use that, and even if we have to use some B footage or something, but to not translate everything that you have seemed like um, it, it's just not the way that we go about making the films. And that's, so the filming was ended in 2017 and it took two years of translating, transcribing, translating, transcribing, and doing bounces, different cuts that we would then take back and share with the community and get their, get their feedback. I mean, we list Adam, Frank and Evelyn as co-producers because they not only facilitated access to their own communities because Evelyn's home, Adam's home are not in La Soita, they're in different villages and- oh, okay. And so they were very much part of planning out that part of the production. Um, in fact, getting our cameras into the UN, Adam is, is known in the UN circles. And so he was the one that helped us get our camera into, into the meetings where we film him in action. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, that was a, lot of, a lot of scholarly work. And one at, last thing I'd like to add, because it's not something that's easily discernible from the film, but there's something, there's a beautiful tradition in Maasai communities that when a child is born, uh, an individual lullaby is composed just for that baby. So every single person in the Maasai community has their own personalized lullaby composed either by the mother or an aunt or a sister or a grandmother. And this song is their song throughout their life. So the way it came to my knowledge is that Evelyn said at her wedding, um, that her mother sang her song. I was like, what do you mean your song? And when she told me that, oh, we all have songs. You mean you don't have songs? We all have songs. <laughs> and uh, we have social security cards. That's what we got. <laughs> but they all have these beautiful songs. And so I was like, really? And so your song is going to be different from your sisters and from your brothers. So I, I spent several days tracking down each of their mothers to sing the song. And I have this fantastic, um, fantastically talented graduate student who's an ethnomusicologist and a composer and musician. And so he took their lullabies, each of them, and remixed it. And that's what you hear in the background. When we're on Adam and his story, we've got Adam's song playing in some variety in the background. When we're on Evelyn, we've got Evelyn's song in the background. We've got Frank in the background. So there's another layer there that, it's, you know, that, that can't be explained terribly well in film, but in any accompanying text down the road. That's, that's beautiful. Wow. But, okay. That's another Peter did a wonder. Peter did a wonderful job on on that because he used the music of of the lullaby, and then brought brought to, you know sc scored it. Uh, but in the Rite of Elders film, uh, the previous film, uh, Frank's lullaby plays a, a central theme in it, and and under over uh, an actual the, the words of of the uh, lullaby are, are are in that film complete. That that's really beautiful. Um, I want. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Oh, there. 
so I didn't realize that they weren't from the same areas. So when when Evelyn is brought and and introduced to those women, they don't know her. They knew her by reputation. By her reputation, they don't know her personally. They had all heard the story okay. of the child whose father gave back the cows. And they were like, oh, this is her, wow. And they were, and that's what was noticeable was that they were, they were worried that she would no longer be Maasai, that she had yeah. gone, she'd become lost. You hear the term several yeah. times in the film, we feared that they would become lost. So the fear was that by getting educated, she would become lost. And yet she greeted them in the traditional manner in, with respect and clearly um, impressed them. And that's what, what you have um, this other guy, Juma, sort of introducing her and saying, she's doing all these good things. She's building a home for her mother. She's not spending her money on foolish things. She's caring for her family with it. So, but he's, he's kind of the go-between trying to reintegrate her with these women who are all fearful that their daughters might do something similar. I was trying to, it's impossible to like read body language, especially when it's like cultural differences and everything. But it was really interesting to watch them watch her. Then mm -hmm. this, like, oh, what's going on there? That was that was really interesting. Um, were there, um, were there, was there anyone in the community who did not want to participate in the filming, or did, did didn't feel like it was a good idea? No, I wouldn't say so. Um... Frank's sister, Mary, who's the one in the cornfield, and she's the first one who taught herself to, to farm. Um, she was a little worried about the boom. She didn't like the boom. <laughs> so, and, the, and the windscreen, the windshield on the boom. Uh, but other than that, that was, I think, the only resistance we felt. There was, we were also very conscious that we had permission to, to film, you know, that we were abiding by the rules of where, we, where our per permission um, extended. So if we ever strayed out of those areas, people would say, no, 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 we don't have permission to film there. So we, we made sure to abide by the, the conditions of our film permit. When you said you were, um, you were bringing, as you were working on the film, you'd bring parts back to share with the community. Do you mean Frank, Adam, and Evelyn, or were you also, were you all also getting feedback from other people? Well, we, we would, when I was staying in Lesoid or at Evelyn's home, then I would show it on my laptop to whoever was in the house or in the community at the time and, and get feedback. The only thing that was once problematic was that Frank's mother died um, in between my recording her lullaby and then the film being completed. And that was hard. It was very painful for people to see her image. Um, so when they were still grieving, so. I remember starting to show them, forgetting that she appears in one small scene in the very beginning, and they got as far as that, and then they had to run away because it was just too painful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. That's interesting. Okay. When you, um, well, I guess for you, Bon, were there any surprises, like once you all started shooting, like some, any surprises while you were filming it that you just weren't anticipating? What? Well, well, not not being versed, uh, I think with the uh, with the the prequel to the film on the rite of passage, uh, not knowing all of the rituals, it's it's just sort of uh, you know following <laughs> following Frank and and his friends, and there's a whole uh, uh, ritual about the the uh, herding uh, stick. Uh, within the rite of passage, and you see pastoral people with these herding sticks, and it, it's it's very important. And and there's a certain timing of the, the 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 sheep, and then the calves, and then the cattle, um, and and vice versa, bringing them home. Those types of things. So um, I was always sort of running <laughs> around trying to get in front and. Uh, the, the Maasai uh, friends uh, around the area were always laughing at me because <laughs> it's like, why is this guy always running? Uh, you know, people uh, aren't running unless there's a death or something. <laughs> and uh, so th th those types of, not knowing those types of cultural things, but um, uh, 
you know, it, it's it's sort of that sense of uh, uh, of wanting to capture the interaction, and um, you know, you you sort of have to be in front of it, and so you are sometimes running around, and it may seem strange to the people that mm -hmm. that are there. But I think that was probably the the biggest surprise, but also um, it, it was just so wonderful uh, to to have. Uh, the uh, the cooperation and and not this fear and and the trust and uh, you know Kelly uh, uh, you know spent time uh, creating that trust and um, I think it's very obvious uh, and and for a long time uh, studying. Uh, anthropology and ethnographic film. I, I didn't want to be a part of it because so few films that I saw had that trust or where you feel there's a trust. And it makes all the difference, I think. Uh, and uh, it's just so, so nice when, you, when, when you're not feeling like uh, you're not trusted and you are in, or you are invading. And, and when you do feel that you should stop filming. And a lot of filmmakers don't do that. Why do you say you should stop filming when you feel that? Because you're invade, you're you are invading. Okay. And and uh, um, you know, I think with the way um, you know we see uh, oh, Big Brother and all these things, it's like it's like okay to invade, and it really isn't. And I think filmmakers in the past from outside of the cultures had this um, sort of privileged position that, well, I got the camera, I can do what I want. And, uh, and we've, we've seen over the years, many, many films that way. And hopefully we're seeing a change in that kind of thing. And, and now, you know, a lot of people are making their own films. And what kept me making films in Africa is, for so long, I just never saw any um, positive images in filming. And I felt an obligation because I knew I lived, I lived there and I knew, um, you know, as a filmmaker, um, another story needs to be told. Um, I can think, but, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I just add one thing, it's that I think that Ron and I are both committed to a participatory filmmaking, collaborative filmmaking with, with people who, about whose lives the films are, are um, focused on. So um, a lot of your earlier work, Ron, has been very collaborative. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about your relationship with the Tanzania Film Company and, and Martin, but in these cases of the films about Lesoit and the people involved, they were part and parcel of the process and, and directing it in different directions too with their requests. You know, it was Frank who said, I found my cousin Evelyn. I didn't know I had a cousin who was a teacher. We must find room for her in the film. And then her story starts to emerge as really unusual and, and interesting and in its own right. So we're following that. And then we're following, how did she get off? How did she get her start to education? Well, it was through Adam's intervention. And I happen to know Adam through the, the UN human rights work I do. So didn't know that these two people that I knew through two separate strands knew each other and were, had, had, had had incredible impact on each other's lives. Um, and then finding, um, um, I encouraged Evelyn to apply for a scholarship opportunity at Arizona, um, Northern Arizona University. And Frank and Juma had, I had been able to go and take um, an English course there again through a connection that I was able to help facilitate. They got in on their own merits and they succeeded on their own merits, but we were able to follow them now in the US context and show all that they were learning and trying to soak up in order to bring back and promote education in their communities. So a lot of it was luck, um, but a lot of it was engaging with people and having them also help contribute to defining the direction of the film. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> excuse me, Ron, Kelly mentioned that when you were shooting, you were living, you were living in the village. Is that is where you were shooting? Is that the case? So yeah. uh, how, when you were doing that, like how long were you living there? Like how, the sort of the stays, like how long would you be there? 
And how would you say that impacted your the way you shot the film? Well, I I was I was living in um, well, someone made room for me in their house in the village. Uh, I think it was Frank's uh, Frank's mm -hmm. house, uh, and uh, we ate meals with the family uh, morning and night anyway, and. Um, uh, it what you know it I didn't spend the time that Kelly did you know our shoots would be maybe two weeks at a time uh, uh, but Kelly uh, you know lived lived and worked there much longer than I did but for instance my very first uh, film in in Kenya uh, my best friend from the university um, you know I it, it was before I was really, I mean, I had made films, uh, short films as in high school and things like that, but um, it was really the, the my uh, friend, it was his family and he became the director. He says, you're not going to shoot just wildlife. <laughs> People are a lot more interesting. You got to shoot my dad doing this, my mom doing this, my, you know, so it, that's, that's how I started. To, to make films because it, it was it was that uh, from the get-go you know not necessarily my idea and and later working with the Tanzania Film Company um, you know it was at a time uh, when Tanzania was really economically struggling and and the company ha didn't have film stock and so I was able to bring film stock and and the, the company provided all the crew and the cast and I wanted to do a documentary, they wanted to do a story and, and it was like, okay, well, and, and we ended up doing this whole scripted story. I wanted to do a documentary on healers and the film I'm talking about is The Marriage of Mariamu. And uh, that film was actually shot in a healers village with him playing the lead role <laughs> and his villagers playing all the other and the best uh, actors in Tanzania playing some of the other lead roles, but it was scripted from, it was like the healer's idea. The first time I met him, he said, you're going to shoot the film here. <laughs> and I was, I was planning to shoot a documentary, you know, 50 miles away. But, you know, it's, it's in a way, um, uh, you know, it was just the, the blessing of being open and, and, uh, uh, being sensitive and sort of going with the flow uh, really helps uh, when you're doing these kinds of uh, projects. Did, I was just curious, did you deliberately not go too far into the conflict between like the farmers and the herders? I, that was when um, there was a point where Adam was at a conference and he was talking about wanting to return home. Um, and that I, so I have to just plead ignorant here. Like I, I guess if there was the conflict in that way, I think I was expecting it to be more with the government and land, but I was completely like caught off guard about the the whole farmer and and um, pastoral life that like that conflict. So I could you just talk a little bit more about that, how it got into the story, and if there was a reluctance to, to go too deep. But that was really interesting to me. Sure. Well, I mean that. When you talk to elders, they, they talk about a period in the past when there was a lot more um, sharing of resources. So that land that a farmer would use for growing crops, at the end of the harvest, all that crop residue, I mean, imagine even in the States when you see a cornfield after they've harvested, you've got stalks of dried, empty corn that has already been harvested, but it's lying about. So that is perfect fodder for cattle and livestock. So there used to be this almost symbiotic relationship between farmers and pastoralists where during the springtime and the summer when water's abundant um, and cattle were able to be provided for with water in the, in the Maasai areas, when it starts drying up, that's when the farmers have harvested, they've got these fields that are full of residue. And then now the cattle, are in need of searching for new pasture and water, it would, it would be even welcomed that they would come because the cattle would aerate the soil by walking all over it. They'd be fertilizing it by pooping all over it and they'd be eating all this crop residue. So things that a farmer would otherwise have to pay for, to remove, 
pay for fertilizer, pay to aerate the soil, was provided with this mutual beneficial relationship. But then, and this is what a lot of the research is, that my team has been about, comes with um, um, sort of a more corporate capitalist model and uh, after Tanzania's ex um, experience with socialism, the ideas of private property rights, which is a cornerstone of the capitalist system and neoliberalism. So when you have private property rights now, now suddenly that mutual sharing relationship disappears. And now I have pastoralist friends who tell me that we are the ATMs for farmers. When they run low on money, you know, if they, they can accuse a cow of having trespassed on their field and eaten some of their crop, and then suddenly we, we're fined, we're hauled into the police, we have to pay fines. So, so that mutual relationship is now gone. It's, it's made worse when so much land is being allocated to more national parks. So I think in the last year alone, there were four or five new national parks created in Tanzania. Each time you do that, less land is available to everyone else. So then land becomes more scarce. Farmers and pastoralists are now fighting over it, a dwindling resource. So in, in another um, forum that I participated in with a, with a lawyer who's Maasai, we did the calculation and it used to be that about 28% of all of Tanzania's land was under conservation. But now our, our best estimate, it's about 46%. So when almost half the country is allocated for national parks and forest reserves and game reserves and things of that nature. Of course, your population, which has not been dwindling but growing exponentially with population growth, now is going to have it harder and harder and harder to make ends meet on the land that's available. So where are where are they hurting? Is the land that they're hurting on is it their land or are there, are there pockets of land that they're not spoken for? How does that happen? There is no land that's not spoken for in Tanzania. And all these major parks you may have heard of, Maasai Mara, the name gives it away, used to be Maasai territory. Serengeti is a Maasai word for endless plain. Um, Manyara, all these areas are used to be the ancestral territories of Maasai. They've been moved out of them now because they're now national parks only for tourists. Um, and so they have been allocated other areas, but which are not large enough to support the kind of mobility that you need as pastoralists. You need to be able to move between areas that are always abundant in water, but you reserve those for the dry season. You don't want to deplete them. Mm -hmm. So you reserve those for the dry season and then you make use of other areas during the rainy season, where you, but it requires this mobility. And that's increasingly infringed on as land gets allocated for other purposes. And this is a challenge for pastoral people all over the world. Yeah. Um, in West Africa, it's with the Fulani. You have similar types of, of, of uh, skirmishes and, and problems and uh, with the, uh, with the uh, herders and the pastoral people in, in West Africa. And, um, you know, everywhere uh, around the world, because of the way things are with land and value and commerce and, you know, uh, there's, there's, there's a money making sense behind why these things are being done, but uh, the people that depend on this. And that's what I loved about being able to show uh, the conflict uh, when the Ma Maasai organized, um, and people couldn't get the meat and the milk, you know, it, you, you, there's still a symbiotic relationship, but it's really not appreciated. And, and uh, I, I, I think uh, the, the, the news footage that we, we used in the film, we were able to, you know, edit it in such a way to, to hopefully make that point. Um, but uh, th this is something, world, a worldwide phenomena, as, as everything, uh, within the film was, was talked about, uh, you know, these, these issues are, are going on. And, uh, you know, with, with Maasai Remix, we were able to, I, I think that's what makes the film so uh, uh, palatable for everyone who sees it around the world. Uh, we've been in different festivals around the world and it's, it's been really well, well received because of the, the issues in it. Mm -hmm. How do the, um, the communities, there, how did they receive the film? Oh, you, oh is it? I don't know. I, I forgot about COVID. Were you able to do like a screening or because before? Okay. 
No, I've just, we've just showed the final version to Frank, Adam and Evelyn. And Evelyn's here still in the United States. She's still in Arizona. Now her husband is finishing up his degree. Um, so we were able to do a screening at Northern Arizona University. Yeah, and Evelyn and her husband and baby uh, were at our uh, LA premiere at the Pan-African Film Festival in Los Angeles and the San Diego Black Film Festival. So they were able to uh, speak uh, to the audience after the film and uh, they, they were really happy seeing it on the big screen. <laughs> I was gonna ask you what everyone's doing now. So Evelyn's, is she, she's planning to move back when her husband, what's their plan? Yeah, yeah. She's actually pregnant with their second child due in April. And her husband, Elia, is now in the process of waiting to hear back on whether he got into master's programs. So she has her master's, he wants to get his master's, and then they both want to go back to Tanzania. Um, Frank is no longer village chair. His term as chair ended, but he's um, very much in the forestry, I mean, working very much to protect their forest. That's really his um, main, main pursuit right now. So he just texted me a a couple weeks ago, he was in an, a sort of national meeting about forest management, um, but the meeting took place in Tanzania. And then Adam is still heading his NGO, uh, Pico Deo, and actively running that office with all the field staff out dealing with issues, you know, that are of concern to the Maasai communities of Tanzania. So the, the original idea, um, the, Frank's the original idea was for you all to shoot the ceremony or to have... Yeah. So, Frank, go ahead. so in, in, in the um, Maasai um, right, life cycle, you, go, you, you have very marked ceremonial points where you're transitioning from one stage of life to another. So from childhood to, um, to a technically adulthood. Um, in the case of men, they become warriors. In the case of women, they become of marriageable age. Um, and then after you're a warrior, you become a junior elder and then a senior elder. Um, and women go through a parallel set of processes as well. So that transition to becoming a fully fledged senior elder is necessary because without that, your children cannot start the ceremonial cycle. So if you have a son, your son cannot be circumcised and make that transition to warriorhood until you have been fully confirmed as a senior elder. So Frank was about to undergo that ceremony. And there have been a lot of films about Maasai circumcision, becoming warriors, also very um, critical films of female circumcision, which is um, something that has been traditionally practiced, less so these days. Um, in the Maasai community. So Frank was becoming a senior elder. As far as I could tell, there had been nothing, no attention. It's like after warriorhood, that's where all the cinematic attention goes. And then after that, it's not interesting anymore. Yeah. So he wanted his ceremony filmed and asked us to come. And I asked to see the women's side of the ceremony because I knew that women would be certainly preparing. And, and as that film shows, the mother of the man becoming confirmed as a senior elder, if she's still alive, is also very much a, a major part of that ceremony. So I needed a female person to assist me in interpreting and that's how Evelyn came on the scene. So then we learned about Evelyn and then we started filming her and Adam and it became too much for one single film, which is why we stuck to our original goal of making the film that Frank requested okay, and then his rite of passage and that film is out now called Rite of Elder, Orchid Tengler Bach, and then the additional material ended up as Maasai Remix. Okay, no, I was wondering, I was like, how do you feel about that? That change? Okay, but you made, you he, made, yeah. oh, is is there, of, sorry? Just that he and Evelyn, they were all part of the decision. Mm -hmm. Is there um, something about the making of the film or the outcome that I haven't asked you about that you would like to share? Ron? Well, I, 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 I would like to share, uh, I don't know whether you're able to put it up on the screen, but I'll, I'll spell the website because none of these films get out without us promoting them. Uh, so it's at 
Grigri, it's pronounced Grigri Films, but it's spelled G-R-I-S, G-R-I-S, F-I-L-M-S dot net. And you can see all of the work Kelly and I have done together. Uh, we've just uh, about to launch uh, the new website that has the 40 years of my work and our collaborations together on the site. And uh, so it'll be much easier. All the old films that used to be on 16 millimeter, they're now streaming high quality. So uh, I urge everyone to, uh, to visit uh, the Grigri Films uh, website. And yes, I guess the one thing I would I would add is that in terms of where we go from here, I know that um, Frank Evelyn and Adam have all talked about wanting um, a, a narrative film about stories that Maasai have passed on, and and so that might be the next project. And at that point, it'd be really wonderful if we could train them in the filmmaking so that they can take a, take on this role themselves. Now that they've been participating in two films three films actually about their community. Who, was it Frank's sister who was farming? Is that, is that who? Yes. Maybe yeah. she'll end up being a boom operator. You never know. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. <laughs> Evelyn did a lot of the jobs too. <laughs> yes, Evelyn was involved. The, um, what, what's next for both of you? Well, <laughs> you're like, once I leave the house. <laughs> we're, well, we're, we're talking about a, a, a couple other films uh, that, that we've shot, but uh, uh, I, I know um, Adam's got a historical uh, story uh, about the, the, the Maasai and a, and a great, great uh, le leader um, that, that we've discussed. And... Uh, but uh, we're, we're just uh, sort of in promoting getting this out right now. But Kelly, I don't know. No, yeah, our focus is still on, on finishing the promotion for this one. Well, thank you for this. I, I was, it was really illuminating. I, I was just really shocked all the pieces of it that I would, had not really seen or considered. And so I really felt like, oh, look, I've got this, fly on the wall like I'm being brought in so it was a really intimate story and I appreciate you sharing it with us thank you so much uh, well thanks for uh the African Film Festival of uh, New York and uh, uh I, I just want to say 20 years ago we premiered uh Mangamizi the Ancient One uh, a dramatic first feature uh, film for Tanzania. It was a, a co-production and it's an amazing film and uh, available. So I thank the festival for uh, highlighting our, our films and continuing through all these years. Thank you.